Well, as Tom mentioned in the scripture reading, I'm going to be speaking from Psalm 121. I think he said, this is one of the songs of ascents, Uh, and that's true. There are actually 15 of these psalms, all 15 of them beginning with the superscription, a song of ascents, or in the King James, it's a song of degrees, but it speaks of upward steps, stepping heavenward. 15 of them in a row, and outside of these 15 psalms that start with Psalm 120, which he read, uh, all the way through Psalm 134, 15 psalms, all labeled that way, and that superscription is never attached to any other psalm. So these 15 psalms have clearly been grouped together by design for a reason, and it's my belief that these 15 psalms constitute a short book of choruses that is within the larger Psalter. It's like a a little songbook within the Psalter. And most scholars agree with that and suggest that these 15 psalms are a collection of psalms that were commonly sung by pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem to worship during the feast time. So these are songs for pilgrims to sing on the road, on the journey. You know, I hope that Jerusalem is situated at a high elevation compared to everything around it. Mount Zion, which is the heart and the high point of the old city in Jerusalem, is 770 meters high. That's 2,550 feet above sea level. And no matter which direction you go, once you get outside of the city limits of Jerusalem, it's basically downhill. If you go east... Once you get past the Mount of Olives, it is all downhill to the Dead Sea, so that from the Temple Mount to the Dead Sea is only about 14 miles as the crow flies, and if you want to get an idea of that distance, that's about the same distance from here to the Master's University, if you're trying to wrap your mind around the the distance. But the drop in elevation from the Temple to the Dead Sea is almost 4,000 feet. And uh, Jericho is the same straight line distance, a slightly different direction, about 14 miles from Jerusalem, but from the Temple Mount to Jericho is a 3,400-foot drop in elevation, and that's pretty extreme. And it means that when you travel from Jericho to Jerusalem, you have a climb of 3,400 feet, And the route will take you on a precarious roadway that weaves around the edges of a steep canyon for about 22 miles or so. And it's a a very dangerous ascent, but that was the route taken by thousands of pilgrims every year as they traveled from Galilee to Judea for the great feast days. And as those travelers made their way up that treacherous road, they would sing these 15 psalms. And that, most commentators agree, is why these are called Psalms of Ascent. And so they're songs for travelers. And you can see evidence of that in the themes they deal with. Our psalm for this morning, Psalm 121, is perhaps the most striking single example of how these psalms would resonate with pilgrims on the Jerusalem road. By the way, this is an anonymous psalm. We don't have any record of who wrote it or precisely when it was written, but it really doesn't matter. The substance of the Psalms is what we really are concerned with, and this one is a great one. Psalm 121 is a a prayer for traveling mercies. It is a powerful affirmation of God's sovereignty and the goodness of divine providence. You know, Psalm 120 that we heard this morning, the first of the pilgrim Psalms, is about persecution. This one is about God's providence and protection, and so they're very different songs, different themes, different tone, and that is true throughout this collection of little choruses. They cover an array of subjects, but ultimately all of them get back to the theme of worship. This psalm, Psalm 121, is a celebration of security for people who are actually in very insecure circumstances. And every verse is is full of comfort and confidence. This is one of those totally triumphant, joyously upbeat passages of Scripture that are given to us as reminders that our Heavenly Father is our keeper, and therefore we can rest secure in His loving kindness, 
even when we're surrounded by road hazards and threats from our enemies and deadly dangers of all kinds. This is a psalm you probably ought to memorize because this will encourage you in every conceivable trial or tragedy or calamity of life. And naturally, this psalm is a favorite of all kinds of people because because it's so upbeat. It's an extremely well-known psalm, and it's been set to music again and again by great composers and contemporary musicians alike. In fact, Felix Mendelssohn devoted two movements to Psalm 121 in his oratorio, Elijah, and the choir sang one of them just a few weeks ago, He Watching Over Israel Slumbers Not Nor Sleeps. I told Dr. Brandenstein I wished he'd saved that to this week, but he sang it a few weeks ago. John Rutter has written an anthem that's based on this psalm that my wife Darlene thinks is the the greatest piece of contemporary sacred music anyone has written so far. And in fact, as I read this psalm, it's probably going to prompt an echo of some music in your mind. You've heard it set to music in many ways on many occasions. So I'm going to read it from the Legacy Standard Bible because I got a copy from the Shepherds Conference and I'm thrilled with it. So here we go, Psalm 121 from the Legacy Standard Bible, a song of ascents. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From whence shall come my help? My help comes from Yahweh, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to stumble. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will not slumber and will not sleep. Yahweh is your keeper. Yahweh is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. Yahweh will keep you from all evil. He will keep your soul. Yahweh will keep your going out and your coming in from now until forever. As I said already, this psalm is a favorite of lots of people, and rightfully so. It's full of precious promises that meet every need we will ever encounter on the upward journey. Its its promises are applicable not merely for travelers on a different earthly journey, but more importantly, this is a song for earthly pilgrims on a journey to heaven. And I'm convinced that is the true and divinely intended sense of this psalm, because the comforts and guarantees in the psalm are not merely temporal reassurances for earthbound pilgrims on an ascent to Jerusalem. These are heavenly promises and promises of spiritual blessings for redeemed saints of all times as we all make our pilgrimage to the new Jerusalem. And the psalm urges us to keep that eternal heavenly perspective. Notice the last word of the last line. Yahweh will keep your going out and your coming in from now until forever. It's a forever psalm. It's about eternity. And so, As we work through this psalm, keep that eternal perspective in mind, because you'll miss the the true significance of this psalm if you think only in terms of an earthly security on a 20-mile journey on a mountain road. But the scope of this psalm is infinitely larger than that. You can see it in the psalm itself. It's not really about physical safety and bodily protection. This is about the eternal preservation of our souls and the unshakable security of our spiritual standing before God. And in fact, let me say it plainly, this is a song about the gospel. The promises that are outlined in this psalm are gospel promises. The psalmist is simply using the theme of journeying mercies to illustrate the benefits and blessings of God's inexhaustible mercy to everyone who trusts Him. And in fact, you could borrow words from 2 Peter 1 verse 4 to describe the content of this psalm. These are precious and magnificent promises that point the way for us to escape the corruption that is in this world. And the structure of the psalm is something you should notice as well. Notice there are eight verses, and they go together in pairs so that you have four couplets, each one highlighting some comforting aspect of God's providential care. Four blessings of God's sovereignty that guarantee the security of our souls. Verses 1 and 2, He saves us. 
Verses 3 and 4, he steadies us. Verses 5 and 6, he shelters us. And verses 7 and 8, he safeguards us from all evil. And I'm going to let that be our outline because I've got some Baptist blood in me and I don't want to let the alliteration go, you know? So you're going to hear that list again. But first, given that there are four couplets and, and my outline has four points, you might think that this psalm divides neatly into four stanzas. But I think actually if you look more closely at the words of the psalm, it seems to divide more naturally into just two parts. Notice that verses 1 and 2 use first-person pronouns, I, my, and mine. But then suddenly in verse 3, the perspective shifts, and the rest of the psalm employs second-person pronouns. And by the way, in the Hebrew original, these are singular pronouns. So this is a very personal psalm. And it bears the marks of being written for antiphonal singing, so that you'd have some cantor or song leader intone the first two verses, and then a group would respond with the words of verses 3 through 8. That's probably how it would have been sung on the road. One guy sings out the first two verses, and everybody answers with the rest. Or it is possible, entirely possible, that the psalmist here is simply raising a question and then answering it himself. Raises the question in verses 1 and 2 by speaking him to himself, he answers it in the rest of the psalm. And in that case, this psalm would be a classic example of the, the psalmist preaching to his own soul. He's instructing himself and reminding himself of truths that he already knew. And the theme, then, that dominates the whole psalm is stated in the very middle of it. Verse 5, Yahweh is your keeper. That opening statement of verse 5, that is the key phrase that sums up the central lesson of this whole psalm. And and by the way, this is, of course, a bedrock gospel truth, teeming with the truth of eternal security and, and the fact that our salvation is all God's work. Yahweh is your keeper. Now, unfortunately, you can't tell this in every English translation, but it is clear in the Legacy Standard Bible. The word keep and its derivatives are used six times in this psalm. In the King James Version, for example, verses 7 and 8 use the word preserve three times. But that is actually translated from the very same Hebrew root that is translated keeper in verse 5. So in the Legacy Standard Bible, the translators have wisely and helpfully stayed with the word keep. And it is the dominant word of this song, and it is the main point of the psalmist's admonition to us and to himself. Keep your eyes on the keeper. That's where your salvation and your shelter and your strength and your security all lie. If you want encouragement in the midst of trials, if you, if you are assaulted with threats or if you are beset with dangers of any kind, just remember who it is who keeps you. That's the theme of the psalm. So let's work through these couplets and notice the four promises by which God guarantees our security. Number one, he saves us. And the psalm starts with the singer's recognition of his need for help. And on the surface, of course, he is praying for traveling mercies, which makes perfect sense in the context of a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. If you can Visualize what that journey would be like for an ancient pilgrim leaving Jericho as he nears the holy city for one of the feasts. If you've ever traveled on that road yourself, then this psalm will be very meaningful to you. Remember, I said it's about 22 miles by road from Jericho to Jerusalem, but it is all uphill, steeply uphill, starting at about 840 feet below sea level in Jericho, where it's almost always scorching hot, and you have to travel to Jerusalem on a narrow, dusty, rocky road at a slow walking pace, and your journey will take you more than 2,400 feet above sea level. So it's a long, hard, full day's journey for anyone who's in good shape, and it could be a two or three days journey or longer for someone who is old or infirm. And you have to carry lots of water, 
There isn't water really on the way. As you know from the parable of the Good Samaritan, there's also the danger of thieves and highwaymen. And in David's time, and for several generations after that, whenever and by whomever this psalm was written, the dangers were multiplied. There were armed enemies, there were wild animals, hostile tribes like the Amalekites and the Philistines, and each of them posed a significant threat. And plus, the road itself is treacherous. More about that in a minute. But when the psalmist says, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains, I want you to notice he is not saying that's where he looks for help. That's where the dangers lie. Those rugged, barren, uninviting hills symbolized all of the obstacles that the traveler needed to overcome in order to arrive safely at his destination. And as he contemplates the journey and, and, and sees the looming dangers, many that are obvious and many more that are hidden, he confesses his desperate need for help. And in the King James Version, the phrase, from whence comes my help, it is unfortunately punctuated and translated in a way that's ambiguous. This is not a statement about the hills. It's an interrogative. He's asking, from whence does my help come? In the Legacy Standard Bible, and really all the major modern English translations get this right, but the King James Version makes it declarative. In other words, according to the King James wording, the psalmist seems to be saying that he's looking to the hills as the source of his help. But on the contrary, the hills are where all the dangers lie. And, and not only physical dangers, but in the hills there were spiritual dangers as well. You know, the high places in ancient Israel were notorious dens of apostasy and idolatry and gross immorality. Jeremiah 3, verse 6, "'Have you seen what faithless Israel did? She went up on every high hill and under every green tree, and she was a harlot there.'" And it's talking about idolatry, spiritual harlotry. And, and in fact, Jeremiah goes on to say down in verse 23, "'Surely the hills are a lie, a tumult on the mountains. Surely in Yahweh our God is the salvation of Israel.'" And the word tumult is also multifaceted. The ESV states it even more graphically why the hills were such places of evil and danger. It says this, truly the hills are a delusion, the orgies on the mountains. So the hills are laden with wickedness and danger, and the psalmist is saying our only help, our only salvation is from the Lord. And he desires deliverance from all the evil pollutions and, and every spiritual danger that was posed by the false worship of the high places. But as he lifts up his eyes, he sees himself surrounded by these rugged hills, and he wonders, where am I going to find help on such a dangerous journey? But he knows the answer, and he gives it immediately. My help comes from Yahweh, who made heaven and earth. He's saying his God is greater than the hills and infinitely more powerful than any danger that's hidden in those hills. In fact, God not only made those hills, but all the earth and the heavens above, God made those as well. We sang about that in verse 2 of our opening hymn this morning. It was really another song that's drawn from this psalm. There's a parallel verse in another one of these pilgrim psalms as well, Psalm 125. Psalm 125 verse 2 says, As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so Yahweh surrounds his people from now until forever. And he's talking there about those same hills. They're filled with dangers for pilgrims who are traveling to Jerusalem. But here his focus is different because once you get inside Jerusalem, those hills provide a natural barrier. They served as massive bulwarks that protected the city from armies, made it easy for sentinels to keep careful watch on the whole region around the city, and it made it hard for invading armies to, to get in by surprise. But notice, the point in Psalm 125 is also there, is that God is greater even than those mountains. He provides a better and more watchful protection, surrounding His people and guarding them from attack, in the same way those mountains encircle Jerusalem, but much better. 
And so again, the point in both Psalms is not that the hills are the source of our help. Both of them are pointing to Yahweh himself and saying, he is our help. He is our only help. Psalm 37, verse 39. The salvation of the righteous is from Yahweh. He is their strength in times of dangers. And the Psalms are full of statements like that. Now remember, I said that the the true meaning of this psalm points us to the gospel. In other words, this is not merely a lesson about temporary help on a hard day's journey. This is about trusting the Lord for His grace from now until forever. That's how the psalm ends. Uh, so, so the principles that are set forth in this psalm are matters of eternal significance for every life in every culture. This is not merely a traveler's guide for Middle and Middle Eastern road trip. So read it that way. Understand that. When the psalmist says, my help comes from Yahweh who made heaven and earth, he's looking far beyond the physical journey that lay ahead of him on that day. He's making a very significant statement of faith. To borrow from Psalm 20 verse 7, Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of Yahweh our God. Or Psalm 33, 17, a horse is a false hope for salvation, nor does it provide escape to anyone by its great strength. Now think about what that verse is saying, because obviously a war horse could actually be a useful hope for salvation in some circumstances. You know, if the threat comes from a foot soldier wielding a club, a war horse would give you a significant advantage, and at the very least, it could outrun the foot soldier and carry you away from the danger. So, so that verse, when it says uh, the horse can't save you from danger, has something much bigger in mind. When the Psalms make statements like that, they are always talking about spiritual salvation, deliverance from the guilt of our sins, and the attacks of Satan and his minions, and ultimately, even from the wrath of God. Those are the real dangers that we face as fallen creatures. In fact, Jesus puts it in proper perspective for us in Luke 12, verses 4 and 5, when he says, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that, they have no more that they can do. But Jesus says, I will show you whom you should fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And he's talking about God. He's telling us the wrath of God is what we should fear, and the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And that's exactly how the psalm writer is thinking in our psalm as he looks to the mountains. He he senses his desperate need for help, and he needs help for the journey ahead, of course. But it's obvious from the direction the psalm takes that he also senses his deep spiritual need for divine grace. And so as he declares his hope in the Lord, his sense of the help he needs turns from the dangers of the moment to matters of eternal significance. And you see that, first of all, in the fact that his perspective is infinitely larger than the hills he's about to climb. The God he looks to for help, he he says, is the creator of the whole universe. And by implication, he is declaring that God's mercies are bigger than the universe. And that's the kind of help he needs. And so he boldly claims it by faith. Yahweh, my help comes from Yahweh. And I love the immediate note of confidence. You know, when we're surrounded by dangers or beset with almost insurmountable difficulties and wondering where we can find help, the normal human instinct is to give voice to some expression of despair or complaint or melancholy. And in fact, I, I confess, I tend to be especially pessimistic when I travel. You know, if I imagine myself in the psalmist's place, I find this is an amazing expression of confident faith. But he's a redeemed person, and he understands that divine grace is ultimately the only help that really matters in anyone's experience. When God redeems a soul from sin and delivers that person from the threat of eternal judgment, there's really very little reason to fear anything else. Psalm 56, verse 11, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. 
What can man do to me? Psalm 27, verse 1. Yahweh is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yahweh is the strong defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? Or Romans 8, 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, you might be saying or thinking to yourself, well, yeah, but righteous people, true believers, do suffer. We can be hurt or even killed by the Lord's enemies. What about the martyrs? Well, I love how Jesus answered that. I already read the verse, Luke 12, 4. Earthly enemies and the powers of evil might kill the body, but after that, they have no more they can do. So that earthly threats up to and including death are all ultimately temporal and short-lived. Isaiah 51, verses 7 and 8. Now, this is God speaking. He says, listen to me, you who know righteousness, a people in whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revilings, for the moth will eat them like a garment, and the grub will eat them like wool, but my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation to all generations. In other words, there is something beyond this earthly life, and if your enemies even kill you physically, they can't ultimately harm you in the scope of eternity. And that eternal perspective is clearly what the psalmist has in mind in this psalm. He's not just thinking about the journey ahead of him as he makes this climb to Jerusalem. My help comes from Yahweh who made heaven and earth. By the way, that's a, that's a good summary of the gospel message. Our salvation comes from God. That's the whole point of the gospel. Christ did everything necessary to redeem us. We don't need additional help or, or merit from some other source. Our salvation comes from the Lord. The psalmist didn't know how all that worked out, of course. He didn't know about the, the price uh, Christ would pay for redemption because the ultimate payment for sin had not yet been offered, but he looked forward by faith to the Redeemer who he knew would come, and this psalm is an eloquent expression of that kind of simple, trusting faith. And by the way, when the psalmist uses the word help here, he's not suggesting that he sees his deliverance as a kind of cooperative effort between him and God. You know, some kind of synergism where divine grace is given to him only to supplement his own merit and his own efforts. That's not the idea, because he possesses no merit of his own. And like every redeemed person in history and in Scripture, he must have recognized that. He couldn't do anything to, to save himself. Titus 3, verse 5, God saves us, not by works which we do in righteousness, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. In other words, salvation is all his work. By grace you are saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works. So the help that we receive from the Lord is comprehensive. It's not a cooperative kind of help. It's comprehensive. God is our deliverer. Psalm 40, verses 2 and 3. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a high rock. He established myself, my steps. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. He does it all. Everything necessary for our salvation. That is one of the central truths of the gospel message. So that's the first promise of this psalm. God saves us, and he does it freely by grace. Here's a second one. He steadies us. Verse 3. He will not allow your foot to stumble. Now, the image here is someone who loses his footing and he slips or stumbles, and on those treacherous mountain roads, that could be fatal. I've actually made the journey from Jericho to Jerusalem twice. I had the privilege of doing it in an air conditioned bus. And I would not want to try it on foot, even with a large group of other pilgrims. And especially if we're, if we're traveling with donkeys and stuff that could push you over the edge. We took a road out of Jericho that went uphill along this deep, barren canyon. And there's nothing green anywhere in sight once you leave Jericho. Jericho's kind of an oasis. After that, it's all brown. 
And I thought it was pretty cool until the pavement abruptly ended and we're in this massive tour bus on a narrow, unpaved, dusty road. I use the road, the word road with an asterisk because it looked more like a goat trail than a road. And just after the road ran out, if you look to your right, you're looking across this canyon, and, and it's fascinating because the opposite wall of the canyon has this high, sheer-faced cliff that looks like there's no way you could ever even get there. But just below the rim of that cliff, there's a massive monastery, an ancient monastery that was built. It's called St. George's Monastery. Some of you know where that is. If, if you don't Google it, it's fascinating to see. And I'm admiring this. And at the point where the road goes literally right to the edge of the canyon wall, it takes a sharp turn. And I wasn't driving, so I wasn't really watching the road. I was looking across the canyon, admiring that monastery, and suddenly I heard everyone in the bus gasp in unison, <gasps> like we're in danger. And you know how buses are built. The, the wheels are placed behind the first or second row of seats so that if you're sitting in the front row, you're actually sitting further forward than the front wheels of the bus. And Darlene and I were sitting on those front row seats. Now, those tour bus drivers in Israel are highly skilled, and this guy knew what he was doing. The way he was driving on that narrow road, I'm sure he was keeping the wheels of the bus safely on the road, but the part of the bus where I was sitting was literally hanging over the front edge of that cliff. I looked out the window, and it was straight down, and I kind of like heights, and I have to say, that was the most amazing thrill ride I've ever had outside a roller coaster. That's the kind of road these pilgrims were traveling on. That is the very road they were traveling on in all likelihood, but they didn't have air-conditioned coaches with skilled drivers. They had beasts of burden and groups of children and elderly people, and on the way up, they would have to make way for caravans and ox carts coming down, and if your foot slipped, you could die. Now, in a biblical context like this, when you read about slippery feet, yeah, that's scary enough, especially if you've ever traveled on a road like this, but the, the language in this kind of context actually denotes something far more serious than a fatal fall into a dangerous canyon. This is a standard biblical picture, your foot stumbling, picture of divine judgment. Listen to Deuteronomy 32 verse 35, and this is God speaking. He says, vengeance is mine and, mine and retribution in due time, their foot will stumble, for the day of their disaster is near, and the impending things are hastening on them. And that's talking about coming of judgment, eternal doom. And the psalmist, who knew the law well, surely was familiar with that verse from Deuteronomy. And it's one more reason I'm confident he's writing about something far greater than road hazards here. He is speaking about God's eternal deliverance and God's keeping power. Is the security of salvation. This is not a promise that you'll never fall down and break a hip. I mean, I hope you never do, but plenty of righteous people do suffer physical injuries like that. However, not one justified believer in the history of redemption has ever stumbled into eternal destruction in the sense Deuteronomy 32 is describing. This is a promise that is repeated numerous times in the Bible. Satan, you know, quoted one of these very promises when he tempted Christ, and he misapplied it in a, in a woodenly literal sense to, to speak of physical calamity, as if this is a promise, you'll never suffer physical calamity. But this, again, is a promise about spiritual security. Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. This is what Satan quoted to Jesus. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. 1 Samuel 2.9. He keeps the feet of his holy ones. Proverbs, 30, uh, Proverbs 3, verses 21 through 26. Guard sound wisdom and discretion, so they will be life for your soul and grace for your neck. Then you will walk in your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be in dread. You will lie down, and your sleep will be pleasant. Do not be afraid of sudden dread, nor of the storm of the wicked when it comes, for Yahweh will be your confidence, 
and he will keep your foot from being caught. Promises like that through Scripture to say that God steadies us in a spiritual sense. Jude 24, God is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy. Or Romans 14, 4, the Lord is able to make you stand. Again, all of these are talking about eternal things, how you will stand before him justified in the end. And he promises to keep us secure. And he does this continually without taking a break from his guardianship. He watches us and keeps us from stumbling. Verse 3, he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will not slumber and will not sleep. This is an amazing text. I love this text. And one of these days, I might preach a whole sermon on this thought alone, that he who keeps Israel shall not slumber or sleep. But for now, Just note that this is making an emphatic statement about how cautious the Lord is in guarding the footsteps of his people. You know, I often wish that I were more vigilant than I am, but I confess to you that I get tired. There is a limit to how good of a guardian I can be. I remember an incident that happened when I had, back when I had only two grandchildren, and they were both just barely two years old, and They would come over after church, and right after lunch was nap time. And they weren't happy about being sent away for a nap. And so, as a ministry to my own grandchildren, I volunteered to take a nap with them. (laughs) I remember this one Sunday, we went off to take the nap, and about 15 minutes later, Darlene came in, and she found me dead asleep between these two giggling (laughs) two-year-olds. And they were wide awake, and they're wrestling with one another, They're crawling all over me, and and I was sound asleep. And and get this, even though they were the ones that were more or less misbehaving, you know, they they were certainly not sleeping the way they should have been, I was the one Darlene scolded. And I have to admit, the the job I did as a nap monitor is not at all like God's care for us. He is able to keep us from falling. Because he himself never falls asleep. There's nothing he doesn't see. And by the way, that's, that's not at all like the pagan ideas of God. All the pagan gods, they, they sleep and do other, you know, human things. Remember when Elijah was taunting the priests of Baal when their God gave them no answer? In 1 Kings 18, 27, Elijah said to them, Perhaps he's asleep and needs to be awakened. Not Yahweh. He's eternally vigilant. He is all-knowing, all-seeing, never looking away, never distracted, never neglectful of his people. There's a great amount of security in that. And notice, and I love this, verse 4 speaks of his watchfulness over all his people collectively. He who keeps Israel will not slumber and will not sleep. That's comforting. But verse 3 expressly makes it individual. He who keeps you, and that's singular, he who keeps you, believer, will not slumber. He is as watchful over one lamb as he is over the whole flock. And why is he keeping vigil over us like this? To keep us from stumbling. He saves us. He steadies us. Here's a third promise. He shelters us. And here we've arrived at the center point in the key verse of this whole psalm, verse 5. Every word in this psalm either points to or unpacks the meaning of this truth, Yahweh is your keeper. And the word keeper there speaks of guardianship. It's it's the same Hebrew word that's used of Adam in Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 where it says, Yahweh God took the man and set him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and keep it. So it's an active word. It's a It denotes a watchful, active care and stewardship. It involves the idea that's already touched on in verses 3 and 4. And and notice, once more, the repetition of the word keep. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will not slumber and will not sleep. Same basic word, and it's used as a verb in verses 3 and 4, then reiterated as a noun in verse 5. He keeps He keeps, 
Yahweh is your keeper. And that same Hebrew word is used throughout Scripture to speak of shepherds and doorkeepers and prison keepers and vine dressers. And think about it, all of those occupations are also employed as metaphors for God here and there in Scripture. They all picture God closely tending His people, not merely watching them, but caring for them, ministering to all their needs, guiding their journey, protecting them from harm, taking, meeting all of their afflictions, curing all of their afflictions, and even atoning for their guilt. So how closely does he tend them? I love this image, verses 5 and 6. Yahweh is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. In other words, God himself is the shelter. He's, he's the one in whom we take refuge. And he hovers so that his shadow shields us day and night. That expression, on your right hand, speaks of a strategic position that is both near and personal, and it's the distinctive position of a defender. Psalm 109, verse 31, he stands at the right hand of the needy to save him from those who judge his soul. And Yahweh is not merely a defender, but also a support and a sustainer as well. Psalm 16, verse 8, I have set Yahweh continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. And then the idea of shade, that's a common figure in Scripture as well. Psalm 36, verse 7, How precious is your loving kindness, O God, and the sons of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. This is the cry of a redeemed heart. Psalm 17, verse 8, Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Psalm 57, verse 1, Be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until the destruction passes by. Or Psalm 63, verse 7, In the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. Psalm 91, verse 1, He who abides in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And since God neither slumbers nor sleeps, he is our shelter both day and night. That's all that is meant by this expression, you know, the moon won't burn you. But I wonder if it's possible. You might wonder, is it possible to get a moon burn? And I, I know there are people who actually believe that. And especially in ancient times, it was thought that too much exposure to the moon could be harmful. You know, so the words like lunacy and lunatic refer to the belief that overexposure to the moon can damage your mind. I hope that's not true because Darlene goes out every night and takes pictures of the moon. <laughs> she hasn't lost her mind yet, although she says I'm driving her insane at times. It's not the moon's fault. The fact is there aren't enough ultraviolet rays coming from the brightest of full moons to give you a moon burn, and there's no reason to think that lunacy is any way caused by the moon. So this is a figure of speech, and, and bear in mind, this is not to be taken in a woodenly literal sense. As we've already seen, the, the psalm isn't actually talking about physical safety. This is about spiritual security, and verse 6 is a figure of speech that simply is meant to reiterate the truth already given to us in verses 3 and 4, that God keeps us both day and night. And verses 3 and 4 talks about, talk about how He keeps us from stumbling. Verses 5 and 6, then, the stress is on how He shields us from any kind of external threat, including those that are unrelenting like the rays of the sun in a desert climate, including also those, those threats that are merely frightening or annoying or otherwise worrisome, like the glow of the moon that exposes you to predators and criminals when what you really need is a peaceful rest during a grueling journey. There is no better shelter from all the various threats to our spiritual well-being than God Himself who has saved us who steadies us, who shelters us, and now finally, He safeguards us. Three times, three more times in these final two verses, three additional times, the psalmist uses that same word, keep. And here he sums up and reiterates all the previous promises 
in one broad category. These statements are deliberately as comprehensive as possible. Verses 7 and 8. Yahweh will keep you from all evil. He will keep your soul. Yahweh will keep your going out and your coming in from now until forever. Three times. And what that stresses is the utter completeness of the Lord's protection. Three statements, all beginning with the words, Yahweh will keep. Verse 7, Yahweh will keep you from all evil. In other words, he'll preserve you from everything that could ever threaten your spiritual well-being. He will keep your soul. In other words, he will protect you from everything that might diminish or rob you of your salvation. Yahweh will keep your going out and your coming in, meaning he will providentially guard and direct your steps. By the way, that's another common expression in Scripture. You're going out and you're coming in. It's a Hebrew figure of speech that means no matter where you go or what you do. Deuteronomy 28, verse 6, Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. And in Isaiah's prophecy to Hezekiah, you'll find it in 2 Kings 19, verse 27, and then it's repeated verbatim in Isaiah 37, verse 28. God says this to Hezekiah, I know you're sitting down and you're going out and you're coming in and you're raging against me. In other words, I see you no matter what you do and no matter what you say. And so when Psalm 121 says, Yahweh will keep your going out and your coming in from now until forever, it means no matter where you go or what you do, God exercises his providential care and guardianship over you. And that promise applies not merely to an earthly pilgrimage that would take you from some village in Israel to the city of Jerusalem. This is a promise about the upward spiritual journey in which God brings us from this life to the heavenly new Jerusalem. In other words, this psalm is a comprehensive promise of eternal security for all believers of all time. No wonder it's one of the best-loved psalms in all of Scripture. These promises will serve you well in every circumstance of life. Yahweh will keep you from all evil. He will keep your soul. He will keep you in your going out and your coming in from now until forever.